Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 15. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I am very excited to introduce my special guest today, Perry Stern. Perry, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Absolutely. All right. It's great to have you here. Perry started his automotive career over 25 years ago as an advisor at a vehicle consulting firm where he helped customers decide which vehicles they wanted and then helped them walk through the purchasing process. He has always been a car nut. That was his first exposure to the inner workings of the automotive industry. He left there in 1995 to become one of the original staff members of CarPoint, Microsoft's automotive website that launched in late 1995. Perry has worn a number of different hats, and in 2002, he became editor of the site. It is now known as MSN Auto. Over the years, Perry helped in planning as well as contributing to various MSN properties in Canada, Japan, and throughout Europe. So Perry, I've told our listeners a little bit about you, so please take some time and share some more about your history, your business, your interests, and your passion for automobiles. Well, certainly, and, and thanks again for having me on. This is great. I, had, uh, I have the unique, I guess, position of getting to work at Microsoft and being an online automotive journalist. And so being a tech geek and a car geek, it's perfect. And so, I mean, I actually did work for a consulting company for quite a while uh, here in Seattle, and we helped people buy cars. We helped people determine what options they should get on their cars. I kind of learned the ordering process, you know, how do people... How do people buy cars? And we would take care of all the negotiation and everything. And then I found out that Microsoft was launching this new thing called the Microsoft Network, uh, which is now, of course, known as MSN. But there was somebody that I knew here that told me there was going to be an automotive site as part of it. So I put in my resume and did not get hired for the job that I wanted. But it turned out that my predecessor had just gotten a job at Car and Driver Magazine and I was in the right place at the right time, and I've been here ever since. And that was in 1995. What's it like working there? People think of Microsoft as this giant machine that's just rolling down the road, but you're in this really specialized apartment, and as you said, in an area of your passion. So what's it like working there? It is a giant machine, but with millions of little components. And we're just one of those little components. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was with somebody yesterday doing a little driving tour of Microsoft and was pointing out one building where they work on Microsoft Word. And there's another building where Xbox is. And then there's a whole other building where there are people who handle advertising. And you know, there are 60,000 people just in the Puget Sound area that work here. And there are three or four of us that work on the auto site. So it gives you an idea of how small our little box is. Only three or four people on that entire site. Wow. We work hard. We know how to make it work. But there were, when we first started, there were a lot of challenges to do media at a tech firm. You know, Microsoft, there are still times when they're not quite sure what to do with us. But we, we have made it work. You know, we've also made it profitable. And the audience that we have now, uh, we are typically within the top three or four or five automotive sites in the country. Wow, that's impressive. So it's 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 been a, it's been a great accomplishment and it like I said it is very different being here at Microsoft, you know, and I'm probably one of there's two of us that are really auto journalists that also happen to be employed by Microsoft. Uh it's kind of fun. What is an average day for you or is there such a thing as an average day? I would say there's not such a thing as an average day. Uh but there are certain things that I'm always working on. We're always pitching new content to the MSN homepage. That's our bread and butter. We refer to it as the fire hose. Uh, we have the right story and the right picture on the MSN homepage. We can get 10 to 11 million page views in an afternoon. Whoa. And so it's, it's, it's all fine-tuning. At the same time, if we have the perfect story and the perfect picture and a tornado goes through Washington, D.C., we will get no traffic. 
it's all a, a fine game of, of moving things around. But in addition to that, we're always working on new features. You know, that's one of the advantages of working for a tech company is we get to do new things where, you know, for example, a decision guide we're working on where we'll have all of the data uh, for every car available in the country and a slew of filters so that you can decide that I want a car that has four-wheel drive and is a station wagon and has 400 horsepower and I'm describing the car I want, uh, and leather interior and uh, you know whatever other features one might want, and it will narrow down the list to the cars that auto journalists like. Oh, wow. And will it come up with a way to pay for that, too? Unfortunately, that's the part that I'm still lacking, which is why that's not what I'm driving. I understand. And actually, you know, and as an auto journalist, it's even tougher because I'm driving a different car every week. And so when that car comes along that I really do like, that I really want, I still have to give it back at the end of the week. And so it's uh, it's it's nice to have, well, you know, nice to be able to say that I've driven the such and such. Uh, but uh, it is always hard to return the keys sometimes. Well, I see you at a lot of different automotive events, and I always think, wow, how much fun it would be to get to do that for a living. I know that one of the images you sent me, you were at the track at Laguna Seca driving a Subaru. So do you get to drive a lot of cars in this job? I do. Uh, We actually have one or two cars every week that comes to our offices here for us to drive and then review. Uh, We also travel around the country, actually around the world, uh, to drive different cars and you know a couple standouts recently uh, I was in Spain last month to drive the new Lamborghini Huracan oh my goodness <laughs> which uh, that that was a good day <laughs> yes a very good day at the track there in Spain where the F1 guys train no it was a different track it's a privately owned track uh, Ascari okay and so it's it's one of these places where the F1 drivers keep their private cars and it's it's more of a a resort that happens to have a racetrack it's it's the ultimate place to go spend lots of money, I would imagine. Oh, goodness. So I imagine uh, your significant other goes, I feel so bad for you having to go on this business trip. I tend not to tell her about the different places I go. She doesn't need, she she prefers not to know about the hotels. (laughs) Yeah, they sound like they're pretty nice places. So that sounds like a lot of fun. And how was that Lamborghini? It was fantastic. I mean, the, the best part about it was that it's ridiculously fast. It gets, I mean, it's not a car for the shy because it will get more attention than you possibly could want, especially in the green one we were driving. Uh, But the best part about it is it's so easy to drive. I mean, that seems to be the new thing with supercars, uh, is that they're not, you know, just scary cars that you drive in short distances and then you go park because you don't want to hurt them, or they don't, you don't want them to hurt you. Uh, With the Lamborghini, it felt like you could just drive it as a daily driver if you really wanted to. I don't know that you would want to, but you could. I interviewed the other day Steve Anderson. He's an illustrator, and he mentioned a Lamborghini that he had an older model years ago as a glass coffin. So <laughs> he loved that car. <laughs> I've heard that the, that the seats in the Lamborghini Countach were described as feeling like church pews. Yes. Probably not something you'd want to sit in for a lengthy time. Uh, you know, whenever I go to car shows on the weekends, you know, everybody always gathers, gathers around the Countach. Oh, yeah. There are exotics at Redmond Town Center. That's the one I was talking about. Yeah, my friend Mike drives his up there. In fact, I had the pleasure of following him once up to that event. And boy, I just rolled all my windows down and just listened as he accelerated as I tried to keep up. And I think every car he passed had their cell phones sticking out the window, taking a picture. It's it's amazing how the the car enthusiast will come out of the woodwork. And some of these people may not have even known what it was. But when you see a Countach, you know, it's it's... It's going to get attention even if you, you know, are used to driving Honda Accords. Absolutely. Perry, this part of the discussion, I like to talk a little bit about a success quote that has some special meaning to you in your life. It's a really good way to get the inspirational tires turning here at Cars Yeah. So take the wheel. So I would call this more of a, a phrase I live by rather than a quote necessarily. But it's getting to point B from point A should, be, should not be as important as the journey in between. I take this to heart when I'm driving a car. I take this to heart in my everyday job. I mean, if I had gone, you know, started this job and immediately became managing editor from the day I started, 
I would have failed miserably. I had no experience. I didn't know what I was doing. Through the my journey here, I've as I've mentioned, you know, as you mentioned in my uh, biography, I've worn a lot of hats. I've done so many different jobs that now I'm to the point where if anybody in my staff isn't here, I can do their job. I can do anybody's job here. Uh oh! Now they know they don't have to show up. <laughs> yeah, that does, there, there's other things that could cause problems with that, though. Of course. But the uh, I find that you know the the learning that you have on the way is is so much more useful than actually getting to that that final stop. In fact, you know, in some cases, you know, you don't really want to get to that final stop right away. And the same thing, you know, when I'm test driving a car, you know, if it's a fun car to drive, you know, like I had a Jaguar F-Type. Nice. I needed to, you know, my wife sent me to go pick up something at the grocery store. I came back in an hour. <laughs> the grocery store is five minutes away. <laughs> because, the, I mean, it's it's that, that journey in between that's just, you know, that's where you really have the enjoyment. You know, the the point B is the is the task that you have to do. The, the journey is the fun you can have on the way or... At least, and not always fun, but education at least. Well, it's uh, life is a journey. Enjoy the ride is a great phrase. And you really answered my next question is how you've incorporated this into your life. And it sounds like you've done it really nicely. I try. I mean, it's it, it just seems so important. And I've tried to explain that to my daughter who is always you know in a hurry to get wherever she's going. And I'm hoping that someday she'll figure it out. Well, they do eventually come back around and listen to you. My daughter's grown up now and graduated and living on her own. And I was told when she went into middle school that they changed from being dogs to cats. <laughs> it's an interesting point. And if people ever have had a dog or a cat, they'll get that. Dogs love you all the time, and cats kind of like you whenever they want to or when they need something. But eventually they come back to being dogs again. And I can tell you as a, a father of two children that have gone through that, they both come back. They're both dogs now. Well, my daughter is 16, so she's, uh, she's not to that point yet. You're a little ways from that. Would you share a story with us, Perry, that really instigated your passion for cars, that pivotal moment when you really realized that you were an automotive enthusiast and you knew you were really a car guy? Well, it's funny. You know, I think about that. I think I was just born with a car gene because I don't remember any point when I wasn't an enthusiast. I mean, and the funny thing is that nobody in my family is really interested in cars. Um, you know, from But as far as I can remember, I've just been obsessed with them. I mean, I remember driving my little matchbox and my corgis on the striped sheets on my bed. I mean, that was my highways. Um, and my mother's a doctor, and she used to get brochures from all the various high-end car companies thinking that she's a doctor, she must be wealthy. And so when I was 10, 11 years old, I had brochures from Aston Martin and Mercedes and Rolls-Royce, and which I still have them all. And so I was tracing pictures of the Aston Martin Virage out of my out of my Aston Martin brochure and putting them up on my wall. And then at the age of 15, I actually sent a letter to Car and Driver magazine asking them how I'd become an auto journalist, of which they never responded. I don't know if they didn't get the letter or if it just didn't get to the right desk. So, But I knew back then that this is what I wanted to do. And the journey was a lot of different angles on the way, but I ended up, you know, now I get to drive different cars every week and I get to write about them. So it's 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 kind of interesting how sometimes things do come around to what you originally wanted to do. It really is. It's too bad they didn't respond to you. I interviewed Dominic Dobson. He wrote a letter. He wanted to be an F1 driver and wow. he wrote letters to all the F1 drivers in Europe and only one responded, Jackie Stewart. Oh, really? And he said, I still have that letter to this day. He inspired me. And he basically told him, just work hard, keep your nose clean, go to school, stay in school, <laughs> all the basics. If you get a letter from a kid who's enthusiastic about what you do, do him the courtesy of responding to him because it can change his life. Well, it's funny. When I talked to uh, Eddie Alterman, who's the uh, editor for Car and Driver, he basically apologized for whoever was in charge at the time uh, because he said he would have responded. <laughs> well, that's nice. He, he redeemed the magazine. Harry, uh, what, what I want to do now is to take you on a journey down some roads that you've driven and really crawl under the hood and get our hands a little bit dirty. I'd like you to share with our listeners a huge challenge or even a big failure that you faced, something that you really pushed through, maybe it's something that got you to your breaking point and you're about ready to give up. But more importantly, how did you get through that and how did you overcome that situation? 
I think, you know, and this is more, I guess, on the business side of things than personally. Uh, when we launched CarPoint in 1996, and I already mentioned, you know, that Microsoft didn't really know what to do with us. As it happened, nobody really knew what to do with us. When the, you know, that was just about the time the Internet was really starting to take off. I still had a modem sitting on my desk here in, at, at Microsoft. But the car companies didn't really know what to do with us. And so we were trying to launch a brand new site and we weren't even able to get photos from anybody. We weren't able to get information because we were not treated as a, as a true publication. Internet, it took a while before Internet was considered a true publication. In fact, we had to hire a photographer to go out and shoot every General Motors car in order to have pictures of the GM cars because General Motors wanted to charge us for them because they just didn't understand. And so we eventually worked out a system and being typical Microsoft, we set up contracts, which I also still have. We have a contract for every car company that we sent off and had their people sign off that we could use their photos for editorial use only. And that was before there were websites where you could go download the photos and things like that. We used to get slides and scan them. I'm feeling really old right now. Uh, <laughs> and so we would, we would, we actually had a whole book of contracts. I remember Porsche saying that we could use their photos as long as no one could copy them. Oh, goodness. And so we never, I don't think we ever figured out how to respond to that. But we eventually overcame that and, and came out with a site with photos for every single car out there. Uh, it was, it was a difficult thing to get over. And even in the local auto journalist group here, uh, my boss at the time, Mark Hickling, and I decided to join, and there was considerable protest that we were not a true, uh, you know, journalistic outlet. And oh, wow. so, but we also had a number of people that were on our side, and we pushed through, and we kept, you know, explaining to them what we're trying to do. And you know, obviously, and, you know, it seems this internet thing is going to take off, and and uh, and it worked out well for us. But it, at the wow. beginning, you know, we weren't quite sure we were going to make it past all these hurdles. Wow. Well, you were truly pioneers. And I think it's safe to say this Internet thing is going along Seems pretty to be. well. Harry, let's talk a little bit about an aha moment. Let's shift gears and go to the other end of the spectrum. When you got to a point and you really realized that, aha, this automotive industry thing is really going to work out. And this is a career path for me that is something fun that I can wrap my passion around. Tell us the steps you took to turn that aha moment into a success. Well, I think it was uh, when I used to work, when I started working for the consulting company. And I'd always been a car nut, but I, you know, the closest I had been to working in the auto industry was working for a rental car agency. I got to drive cars. That was fun. But when I saw the ad for the, uh, and actually it wasn't for an auto consultant necessarily, it was to do customer service for a buying service. Uh, for a local firm here in Seattle area. And so I applied and I was able to get the job. And I think I mentioned earlier, it was my first view of what the industry was like. I mean, my my boss wrote a column for a local newspaper. He did some radio work. Uh, and I was able to, you know, really learn about the cars, to learn about, you know, what happens in the industry, learn how people buy cars, learn how people negotiate for cars. Uh, at the same time, I learned the other side of it, the editorial side of it, because he was a journalist and, you know, they got press cars, which, you know, I had never heard of them giving people cars to drive to write about. Uh, and that was the first, you know, that was the first time I got to go drive press cars, even if it was just to go get gas or something. Uh, but I got to drive a Viper, the first Viper when it first came out. Uh, and that was just an absolute thrill. And so that, I mean, I think this was when I realized that, you know, I can actually make a living in my passion, which is cars. I mean, up till then, it never, I mean, there were no jobs that had occurred to me that I could do. And, you know, there, there, because the internet wasn't really there yet, there were considerably fewer publications. I hadn't really thought about auto writing besides the fact that I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know how I would get there. I was a political science major in college. Uh, so obviously that's helped a lot. Um, and so it's it was really uh, great knowledge to know that I could do that. And then when I found out about, the, out about the job at Microsoft, I jumped at it because I could see that growing much larger than where I was at uh, the consulting firm. It was great to find out. And obviously, you know, as they say, the rest is history. It worked out pretty well for me. I think it has. That's tremendous. Let's have a little fun here and talk about your first car. 
Could you share with me what that was and maybe talk a little bit about some fun you had with that car, whether it be modifying it or adventures? Well, I, I had a 1976 Mercury Cougar XR7, uh, which was black with, uh, I guess we call it the mag wheels back then. It had four different tires on it, which I, I didn't realize that that was a bad thing necessarily. It had a chrome gear shift that where my fingers would stick to in the winter because it would get so cold. I lived in Indiana, and it, we had very cold winters there. Uh, it had a 400 cubic inch V8 engine, which I've looked up since, that put out a, a, a mass of 160 horsepower. <laughs> oh gosh! And I drove that, you know, to college and back. It was, but it it was it was my first car that I was able to, you know, it was that I could go out and drive my own. It looked cool. Uh, all my friends thought it was, you know, one of the coolest things ever. It, even though it had so many issues, I mean, to give you an idea, I was driving back from Iowa back to Indiana and hit a pothole and a huge chunk of the bottom of the car fell out uh, because it had rusted away, and I just watched it rolling down the freeway behind me. And oh, uh, it had a gas leak. It had all sorts of problems, but uh, it had an 8-track tape player, of which I bought a cassette adapter so I could listen to my cassettes in my 8-track tape player. But it was, <laughs> you know, I had that car for, I guess, three or four years. Uh, it, it was, uh, my father had a construction company. I once used it to help push a uh, very heavy uh, uh, water heater into a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was it was a plow. plow. It did all sorts of things for me, but uh, it also it was one of these cars. You know, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Had mostly hood, a little bit of passenger space, and a little bit of trunk. Uh, so not the most useful car in the world, but I loved it. That's it was cool. That, that was all that mattered. It was much cooler than the next car, which was a two tone green Chrysler Newport. We won't talk no, about that. No. A little seller's remorse here. Is there a car you've had in your past that you really wish you hadn't ever let it go and you'd like to have it I back? do. I used to have a, uh, a 1988 Toyota Celica all-track turbo, which is – I never realized at the time how rare the car was. And it was one of those things that I probably shouldn't have even bought it because it died on the test drive. I had to walk back to the dealership. <laughs> And I bought it anyway because I really liked it and I really wanted it. Uh, at the time, I had, I had older Celica before that one, and this one had a whole 190 horsepower, which, you know, at the time was massive. And the car was just absolutely a blast to drive. It was, you know, manual transmission, had great you know, great traction, um, burned through the clutch a couple too many times when I tried to do, you know, fast starts, and the wheels don't spin, so something has to spin. Uh, but... Mm -hmm. I finally did sell it. it. It had its issues. It was probably the lemoniest, the lemoniest Toyota probably ever built. But uh, eventually I did sell it for something that uh, – actually, it's time to think of it. I sold it and didn't get anything in return. That was right after I got married. And I guess you could say in return I got a little girl. Well, I don't know if it worked nice. that way. I think it was the other way around. But Yep. Well, that's pretty special. Well, that is a unique car. It was, it was very rare. They, they only built a few of them. It was all-wheel drive. And it had it was basically you know a rally car, but they built it for so it was prior to any WRXs coming here. Um, they were easy to spot because they had huge fog lights on the front, of which you know constantly I was bending them back by going in through too low of uh, curbs. Uh, but uh, it was you know it had ABS 1998. Sorry, it was 98 Celica Alltrack. So it had ABS. It was the first car I'd ever seen with ABS. So it was pretty advanced for its time, but I think that was part of the problem is that was it was unique in that uh, everything on it was unique, which made it that most people didn't know how to fix it. So it, it, it had its issues. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. Just a few. Is there a current project, Perry, that you're working on that you could share with listeners that really has you excited right now? Well, there is. There's not much I can say about it, unfortunately. There is a new version of MSN coming, which I can say. Uh, of which oh, cool. I've been pretty tight in everything from figuring out new features to the new design, um, the new partners that we'll be working with. And so this has been taking, you know, you asked what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Lately, this is what I've been doing on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, several design reviews a day. And that's, it's an interesting thing with Microsoft is our designers are in Japan. And so just, you know, it is a worldwide company. And so we meet with them once a day at the end of the day, our day, which is the beginning of the day, their day. And we do everything via teleconference and sharing of documents. And, you know, it, it sounds like it would be 
difficult, if not impossible to do, but it actually has been working pretty well. Uh, you know, it's, I guess it's kind of the way Boeing built the 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 uh, new seven eight seven. It was all uh, branched out all over the all over the world, and so that's what we're doing. But it's it should be very exciting. It's coming uh, should be this fall, uh, and it'll be a whole new look for what uh, the, our site as well as the rest of MSN will be. Well, it sounds wonderful. We'll look forward to seeing that. Is there a favorite way that you like to spend time with cars? Is it in the garage, wrenching on them, detailing them? Restoring them or driving? It's them? mostly driving them. And I will. I'll be the first to admit. I know very little about fixing cars. Um, I've always been on the consumer side of things, and and I love driving them. And my favorite thing is driving and, photo- and photographing them. And so, I mean, I have a number of spots near my house, out and you know, uh, towards Sammamish, where I can you know have nice backgrounds and get some really good shots of cars. And so it's become, it's it's you know a hobby that's actually turned into part of the business and so now whenever we have a press card that's that's worthy i would go out and and shoot a number of photos of it for a gallery to go on the site as well uh but there are a number of places where i can take the cars but even my own car i mean i recently bought uh i guess it's my midlife crisis car is what my wife calls it but it's a 2006 mazda miata and nice. I just absolutely love this car. It's it's funny. It actually makes it hard to drive the test the press cars sometimes because when the sun's out and I have you know uh, a sedan of some sort to drive, I want to take my car instead. It's uh, great to have a car that you're passionate about that you want to drive all the time. And you mentioned earlier you wear a lot of hats there, and so we'll add another hat as photographer. Exactly, on your head. exactly. And it and it is a lot of fun. I mean, I I've I've seen enough photography over the years that I know what it should look like. I mean, I I have to shoot you know a hundred pictures to get the five or six good ones. I think, uh, but it's uh, you know I I had a chance. I had a, a yellow nine eleven uh, that I was driving testing out, and it just happened the place where I was shooting. There was a rainbow behind it. And it looked if if I got to the right angle, it looked like the rainbow was coming out of the top of the car, and so it was you know sometimes you get lucky, and that was that was a very cool photo I was able to get. Well, that sounds great, Harry. This is one of my favorite parts of our discussion, and I call it the last lap. And this is where I fire off a series of questions, and you give our listeners very quick blips of the throttle answers. I got the engine ready. Okay, here we go. What is the best automotive advice you've ever received? Uh, buy the car that you like. Don't buy the car, and and don't buy the car that uh, is the right car to have necessarily. Buy the car you like. I like that one. Would you share one of your personal habits that you believe has contributed to your success? Um, I guess obsession, I suppose, would be the proper word. I'm uh, obsessed with cars, but I'm also obsessed with the. I mean, because I've put so much time into the site that I work like crazy to make sure it's the best thing out there. Is there a resource that you'd like to share with our listeners? A website, a supplier, a restoration shop maybe that you think would be beneficial? Well, there's a website I know. Uh, if you go to autos.msn.com, you know that's what we've built here. As, as I said, it used to be CarPoint. And there's everything from stories about Lamborghinis uh, to details about what car to buy next, uh, all kinds of specs, features, reviews of every new car out there. We also have data going back to the mid-90s of used cars. So you can go and s- compare the specs of your you know, 95 Mazda Miata. Actually, I guess it was 97. You can, you can compare the specs from old cars to new cars and see what the differences are. Pretty oh. unique in that. Is there a book that you've recently read that you'd like to share with uh, I recently read, actually, I recently read The Arsenal of Democracy, uh, which is, uh, it's uh, A.J. Bain, I believe. He's also wrote Go, Go Like Hell. Uh, okay. And it's all about, The Arsenal of Democracy is all about how the car companies stepped up during World War II and stopped building cars and started building bombers and tanks and bullets and and everything for the war effort. It's It's absolutely amazing. Wow. Well, we'll make sure we post that on your show notes page so people can find a link to that book. Sounds very interesting. I'm familiar with Go Like Hell. I have that book, but I haven't heard of the it one. It literally just came about. out two weeks ago, I think. Well, that's why. I've been too busy interviewing people. I'll find some time to read that for sure, and we'll share that with everybody. Okay, we're up to the checkered flag, and this is the last question. And sometimes this can be a little challenge for people. I like to call it a real doozy. If you could buy only one collector car and park it in your garage, and this would be something you couldn't sell to buy a bunch of other cars with. You've got to keep it, and money is no object. 
what would it be, and more importantly, why? I think it would probably have to be a Mercedes SL Roadster. I love the look of them from the 50s. I love the, the styling. As much as I like the Gullwing, I like a convertible, and as spoken by my Miata. Uh, but I think the reason I, the car, the SLs that I have dri- ridden in, I've not had a chance to drive one, they feel like they are fun to drive. You know, that they're, they are a driver's car. It's not just something to put on display at a museum somewhere. And if I were to buy a collector car, it would have to be something that I could drive. They are beautiful. You're talking about the 300 SL Roadster? Yeah, they are spectacular. I've not had the privilege of driving one. I've got to ride in one. And it felt surprisingly like a more modern car. Exactly. Very solid as a Mercedes should. But uh, those are beautiful cars. So great choice. In fact, gentlemen, I just interviewed yesterday. Steve Kelly, a cartoonist, really? that was his car of choice as well. So back-to-back 300 oh, SL funny. lovers, that's interesting. Well, Perry, you've taken us on a great ride today, and I've really enjoyed your stories. I want to thank you for sharing everything with us. If you could give our listeners one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that SL. <laughs> I wish. And let our listeners know what's the best way for them to learn more about you and what you're up to. And then we'll say goodbye. Well, I think, you know, the, the thing to realize is, you know, I was a political science major, but I always had a passion, passion for cars, and I found a way to turn that into a job. And I think there, there are so many opportunities to take your passion and figure out how to push that into some sort of job so that you can continue to live it and make a living. You know, that's, you know my mother told me a long time ago that if I actually liked what I did as for a job, I could consider myself lucky. So I feel lucky. And what's the best way for people to uh, learn a little bit more about you? Um, really, it'd be up on the automotive on the autos.msn site. I mean, if you do a search for me, you'll find all the stories I've written and obviously a lot of photos that I've taken now too. Great. Well, we'll look forward to seeing those. Listeners, you can find all the links that we've talked about here today on carsyad.com slash Perry Stern, S-T-E-R-N. Just go to carsyad.com and type Perry in the search bar and it'll pop right up. Perry, I want to thank you for being so generous with your time and your expertise and sharing your experiences and your life with our listeners. Until we talk again, we'll see you down the road. Thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, we will definitely see you on the road. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!